from Microbe TV. This is Beyond the Noise, episode number 71, recorded on June 23rd, 2025. <music> I'm Vincent Racaniello, and joining me today is your host, Dr. Paul Offit. Hi, Vincent. This is the video version of Paul's column over on Substack called Beyond the Noise, cutting to the chase on important health topics. Today, we'll talk about Paul's latest column, RFK Jr.'s letter to Congress. So, so tell us, Paul, why did RFK Jr. feel it was necessary to write a letter to Congress about no longer recommending COVID vaccines for healthy pregnant women and children. Right. So when RFK Jr. did his one minute video on X stating that that he was no longer going to be recommending COVID vaccines for healthy young children or for healthy pregnant women. As of today, the COVID vaccine for healthy children and healthy pregnant women has been removed from the CDC recommended immunization schedule. There was a lot of pushback especially from groups like the uh, American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, which knew that uh, pregnancy was a risk factor and that the World Health Organization sees it as a risk factor. Every country in this world sees it as a risk factor. And suddenly he said that it essentially wasn't a risk factor for severe COVID. So he wrote this, this three-page frequently asked question sheet that he submitted to Congress to try and explain why. Congress request this, or was this of his initiative? It was his initiative. And how did the CDC react to this announcement? Well, they were blindsided by it. They had no idea it was coming. And you can see the confusion. So, for example, if you look at uh, pregnancy, um, on the CDC's website, it still lists pregnancy as a, a high-risk uh, medical condition. But if you look at the adult vaccine schedule under pregnancy for COVID, it says no recommendation. So I think it's been confusing for people, but it's certainly true that there are a number of pregnant uh, women who are having trouble getting that vaccine. One, because insurance company might not pay for it. And two, because, because it is listed as a no recommendation. Um, that there may people may feel that there's a liability issue if they're giving something that's not recommended. So in this letter, he cited uh, four studies, uh, and he said the safety and efficacy of COVID vaccines had not been established. So let's go over these studies. Study number one, a study of miscarriage after COVID vaccination. What did they conclude in this paper? The opposite that SARS-CoV-2 didn't increase one's risk of miscarriage. It's just a blatant misrepresentation of that study. So, so he said it did increase miscarriage, right? Right. It's, it's just remarkable. He just, he just lied about it. I mean, you call it a misinformation, but it's also a lie because that's not what the study said. There's nothing in the study that says that. Right. This, it, the study concludes the opposite of what he claimed. Right. Okay, study number two is a study of the safety of COVID uh, vaccine during pregnancy. What did RFK Jr. say the paper concluded? I think he said that it increased the incidence of preterm labor. Um, but again, the uh, paper concluded exactly the opposite of that, that there was no negative effect during pregnancy. Yes, that's, that's correct. And I just wanted to point out, though, they do say in the paper in women vaccinated during the second trimester, there may be an increase in the rate of preterm birth. Maybe. They're not sure. Right. So, so he clearly misrepresented that. Of course. Yes. I mean, he's the paper concludes that there's no <laughs> increase, I think, in babies born with lower weight, le just less than gestational age, I think is the term, right? Right. And uh, early labor. And then study number three is a study of 99 million vaccinated people all over the world to look at adverse events. What, what did RFK Jr. conclude from that? He concluded there was an increased risk of placental blood clots when the term placental blood clot was not used in that paper. Yeah, as far as I could tell, they were looking at the known adverse events like myocarditis and um, the ventricular in fact, I forgot the name of that. Um, let's look it up so that we don't um, look like we don't know where to, at least I don't look like we're number. Study number three, yeah. 
uh, the, the, the safety studies, myocarditis, pericarditis, Guillain-Barre, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, all of known uh, side effects at the time of, of this study, right? Right. Uh, so again, he misrepresented the adverse events because as you say, blood clotting wasn't even one of the events mentioned in this study. He made it up. He made it up. And then there's a safety study in children um, which um, concluded, in fact, that myocarditis is is high in uh, in people who receive COVID, and that's what he claimed. But what did he omit from that? <laughs> right, he omitted the fact that, first of all, myocarditis is far more common and far more severe after natural infection than after vaccination. Two, he omitted the fact that, at least according to the data that were recently presented to the CDC um, and the Advisory Committee for Immunization Practices, that myocarditis has essentially disappeared um, because we have now a highly vaccinated population or a population that's been highly naturally infected. You see virtually no myocarditis right now. And if anything, what he's done is he's asked the companies to uh, put an enhanced warning about myocarditis because... His job as an anti-vaccine activist is to scare people as much as possible. Now, this is some, there's a problem with this paper, right? The, the conclusions, I mean, I'm not sure these, these are correct, that myocarditis is 223 times higher than the average of all vaccines for the past 30 years, that there were 92 deaths associated with myocarditis. Where do these data come from, Paul? So they come from the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System, which is um, at best a hypothesis generating system, but it's not a hypothesis testing system. So if somebody, for example, uh, is claims that after receiving a vaccine that someone passed away, um, that really has to be verified. Um, and, and more importantly, to be examined in the vaccine safety data link where you can look at people who did or didn't get the vaccine so you can get a better idea of what were causal associations rather than these coincidental mm -hmm. associations. I mean, there are, there is a value to VAERS. I mean, the Vaccine Adverse Events Reporting System did pick up into susception, which is intestinal blockage following a rotashield vaccine in 1998. And then when the right studies were done, meaning looking at vaccinated versus unvaccinated group, you could see that there was a rare a consequence of interception in roughly one in 30,000 children who got that vaccine. Similarly, VAERS did pick up myocarditis as a cause of, uh, as, as a consequence of the mRNA vaccines. VAERS picked up um, clotting as a rare consequence of the adenovirus vector J and J vaccine. But again, you can only show that that's real by doing, looking at control group, meaning got the vaccine, didn't get the vaccine. And that's how we knew that that was a real association. But if you just assume everything that's reported to VAERS is correct, you would be wrong because it's an unfiltered system. Anybody can report anything. And often when deaths are reported, the CDC will investigate that to see whether it really was causally associated with the vaccine. And invariably, it wasn't. So this paper is, is misrepresenting some of those VAERS data because they haven't been that it's so maybe those 92 deaths to myocarditis aren't actually correct. That's right. They weren't. And the 223 times higher rate is not correct either. You, you can't make any comments about VAERS. VAERS is a, it, it, it raises a question, but it doesn't answer the question. So if you have a, a report on VAERS, then the CDC will look into it and do a, a, a retrospective study of vaccinated and non-vaccinated to see if there is actually a signal, right? That's exactly right. And the, the example I use here in this uh, substack is Jim Laidler. So Jim Laidler was a physician in the West Coast who reported that after he received an influenza vaccine, uh, his skin, skin turned green, he started to grow, and he turned into the Incredible Hulk. You can still find that on the website and on the VAERS website. So if 10 people reported it, then you could say 10 people have turned into the Incredible Hulk after getting an influenza vaccine. The point is, it raises a hypothesis. It doesn't test the hypothesis. So, so he did that to make a point, right? That's exactly what he did. <laughs> yeah. So, so the thing is that VAERS can be useful, but the anti-vaxxers have kind of turned it around and said, look at all these side effects, right? Now, I think that, that when the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act passed in 1986, it included the Vaccine Injury Compensation mm -hmm. Program, but also included the VAERS program. And at the time, people thought, you know, this is going to be a very noisy system and people are going to misuse it. And that's exactly what the anti-vaccine activists have been doing ever since it went into effect in 19, 1988. They point to the VAERS data and they say, see, look at all these side effects that are being caused by vaccines. 
when virtually none of them were being caused by vaccines. Um, sometimes it, it did raise the appropriate question. So I do think it had value for the Rotashield vaccine. I think it had value for the mRNA vaccines. I think it had value for J&J's vaccine, but it is a horribly misused source of data. Now, in, in RFK's original one-minute video, he said that um, the the efficacy, he said safety, which we've talked about, but also the efficacy of COVID vaccines had not been established in pregnant women and young children. Is that true? Last year, the Biden administration urged healthy children to get yet another COVID shot despite the lack of any clinical data. Well, so, so young children, say children between six months and five years of age, there, there is a published study looking at the efficacy of that vaccine, specifically Pfizer's vaccine. It was about 73% effective after dose three in young children. So, of course, it's effective. And, you know, now hundreds of thousands of children have been given this vaccine. So we have a very good idea of its safety. So it's just uh, not true when he makes these claims. And his goal is to just misrepresent data. And I think what's most upsetting to me about this is he'll blatantly lie about the conclusion of a paper because he assumes no one's going to read it. And he's right. People don't read it. I think when he submits that frequently asked question sheet to Congress, he knows that people aren't going to read the papers that he's citing. He assumes that um, just simply by citing them, people will believe that um, it was based on good data. So what is your conclusion about uh, this letter that he wrote to Congress? I think it is at least cynical and uh, horribly dishonest. And I think, you know, had this been submitted to a 10th grade science class, it would fail. But when it's being submitted by the Secretary of Health and Human Services, I think it is a staggeringly negative statement about his integrity. Have any members of Congress criticized this letter at all in public? I'm sure they've either never read it and certainly never read, read the references. And this is not new. I, you look at that Make America Healthy Again report, which is a 90 plus page report. Many of those references were bogus and some of the references made statements that weren't true. And RFK Jr. does this all the time. I mean, when his, in his war against, um, ethyl mercury, thimerosal, when he was on Rogan, when he's on national television, when he's spoken in front of large groups, he always refers to this paper by Burbacher out of the University of Washington and that the study where they gave young monkeys this ethyl mercury containing preservative thimerosal. And he said, and when they looked at the brains of those monkeys, they had like the worst inflammation that anyone had ever seen. Well, read the paper. It doesn't say that at all. It does. It, the ethyl mercury created no problems, no clinical problems, no inflammatory changes in the in the brain. It's just a complete and utter lie. He said it on Rogan, um, so it gets a lot of play because he knows no one's going to read the study. Yeah, I would think that at least Dr. Cassidy, who is a medical doctor, would read his letter and take a look at the references and at least look in your column and take a look at the references, but apparently he hasn't done that either. And Cassidy is very upset with him, right? Obviously, he's not that upset because RFK <laughs> has continued to cross a line after line after line. I mean, uh, he, he, he uh, Cassidy put out a series of statements that RFK Jr. had made to him after that second confirmation hearing that he would abide by, that he wouldn't, for example, change ACIP recommendations when that's just what he did regarding pregnancy and young children that he wouldn't reconfigure the um, advisory committee for immunization practice, which he just did. So so apparently uh, Cassidy, Senator Cassidy draws lines, RFK Jr. crosses them, and nothing happens. I think RFK Jr. has learned that he is currently under no government oversight. Does RFK Jr. really believe this misinformation? So if he says this study found blood clots and there isn't any, does he, does he believe in it, or does he have some other reason behind doing it? I can't figure out how his mind works. I don't know. Well, one thing we can conclude is that this kind of misinformation is why he got this job, right? Right. I think, you know, it's it, he lies and lies and lies. I think shameless is, can be used as a superpower. And I think that's what he has. He is shameless. He will lie and lie and lie. Does he know he's lying? I don't know. I think he has an agenda. He pursues that agenda, which is this anti-vaccine, anti-science agenda. And whatever it takes, he's going to do. We'll put a link to this column in the show notes so you can read it and follow the links to the studies and see that he has completely misrepresented them. It's Beyond the Noise with Dr. Paul Offit. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Vincent.